do it, but I'm not very graceful right now. So my ass would probably fall down, get a subdural hematoma, hit my head on this, and my wife would get paid. <laughs> okay, so this is my finest lecture. This is your inhalational agents. I will capture all of these lectures like I did for your stats. Your uh, understanding of this block and the pharmacology blocks has to be much more in depth because this is your bread and butter. This is what you're using every day. I would have to say the four most important drugs that you will use are propofol and these three agents. Some of you will have preferences. Some of you won't. My preference is sibofluorine. Because it can't, it's cheap and it's got a moderate solubility. We'll talk about that. So when you use these drugs, you will all have your preferences. But now we have to learn about all the properties of each of these drugs. So since this is one of your first blocks in true anesthetic drugs, what is anesthesia? What would you say anesthesia is? It's this state of analgesia, amnesia, loss of consciousness, inhibition of the autonomic system, and skeletal muscle relaxation. Right? And when you see that, you can picture it like this. I say there's five A's to anesthesia. You've got <coughs> amnesia, you've got anxiolysis, analgesia, autonomic control, and apneusis. Stacy, so what's apneusis? That's right. A without kinesis movement. And what do you think that relates to, Mr. Smithers? The use of what drugs? Paralytics. So think about your colors on your labels. Anxiolysis. What label is usually orange? The Dazzleland. What label is usually light blue? Your opioids, right? What labels are usually purple? All of your pressors. Well, your anesthetic labels will be purple too. What about the red? Those are your paralytics. Okay. Now, I am going to test you on these labels. So listen to what I say. If you have white and purple, right? Like you have a white diagonal through your purple, what do you think those classes of drugs do to the purple drugs? Reverse. The opposite effect, right? So if you give a presser, or if you give something that is going to stimulate the cardiovascular system, and you give a drug that has a label right after it that is white and purple, you're going to cause a depression of the cardiovascular system. <clears throat> For example, <coughs> excuse me, if I give uh, epinephrine, okay, and then I give hydroglycerin. Imagine what those labels look like. Epinephrine is going to be purple, sometimes black. And the nitroglycerin will have the purple and white stripes. That's just an example. There's several others. Now, anybody remember the drug flumazenil? It's a drug that you use to reverse first set. Flumazepam, flumazenil, yep. What color is its label? It's orange with white stripes, white diagonal stripes. How about Narcan? What is it used for? Reversal of the opioids. It's blue with white diagonal stripes. <clears throat> Notice, though, your gases don't have a reversal. How do you think you get rid of your inhalational agents? You blow them off. That is the only way to get rid of the modern agents. And you'll see why I'm constantly referring to the modern agents. 
because the older agent, like halothane, 20% of it is extracted by the liver. But the other ones, not significant when you do your anesthetic. So you have to control their ventilation to remove the drug. All right, now that we've talked about the five aids of anesthesia, are all of these necessary? Three of them are good to have. Three of them are nice to have. Not necessary to, to, to get this state of anesthesia. Right? And this is, think about anesthesia. What is it? It is the loss of sensation and the ability to not remember something. Okay? So the only two things, and not move, got to be able to. One of, that's one of the things, uh, one of the cardinal reasons you're giving anesthesia so the patient doesn't move during the procedure. So the only two things you really need are amnesia and akinesis. So what drugs give you these? Well, your hypnotics and your IV agents like propofol and your inhalational agents will give you amnesia. And pay attention to this. The amnesia is uh, modulated or, what's the word I'm looking for? Controlled by the brain, the effects of the gases on the brain, and the akinesis of the inhalational agents is controlled at the level of the spinal cord by the gases. And you're probably like, how in the world did they figure that out? Well, a guy named Dr. Rampill, R-A-M-P-I-L, did some studies on sheets where he separated the circulations. Somehow figured out that amnesia is regulated in the cerebral cortex and akinesis is regulated at the spinal cord. All right, so where did we get this wonderful thing called anesthesia? In the 1500s, we actually had it around. No one used it. They didn't realize what it was for. Mr. Cordes made this sweet vitriol. All right? And then Joseph Priestley prepared formulations of nitrous oxide. And then Davy said that, or showed that you could use this to give relief from a dental procedure. All right? And if you look real close, the old bald guy kind of looks like Dr. Craig, right? <laughs> Maybe he's in that picture. I don't know. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm breathing a little heavy because I'm not feeling great. Uh, Colton found out a nice, efficient way to extract the nitrous oxide out of ammonium. Right? And then Crawford Long. He used ether. Robert Long was an obstetrician and a general practitioner. But it was William Morton who actually William Morton that actually got credit for um, using ether and nitrous. Right? And what is significant about September 30th, 1846? That's, that's Ether Day, right? That's the, the day that everybody, I think that nitrous oxide should say Ether. Okay, this should say Ether. I can't believe we've had that on there for three years. Just notice the truth. So Ether Day. So why did Crawford Long get credit for it? He didn't publish it. He didn't have an audience. He did it in his clinical practice. So there's this huge controversy back in the day of who should get credit for it. And actually wrote a book on it if you're ever interested. I actually have it. I can copy it for you if you want it. So now the history is important, right? It's, it's important to realize how far we've come. So when do we start using these? gas agents really started using them, okay? Well, they were in use in the early 1900s. 
But what did we start noticing about the use of chloroform in ether? You were killing people. What did it do? Especially with the advent of electric cautery. It blew up. Imagine having ether saturating your body and a spark initiating. What happens to your body at that point? It explodes and creates quite a mess in the OR. <laughs> so, what did, what did the chemists do? Realizing that they wanted to keep the great properties of anesthesia of these drugs, but they wanted to get rid of the flammability. Well, they came up with halothane. <clears throat> Collagenation of, the, of that ether is what reduced the flammability. So now you have a drug that works very similarly to ether and doesn't blow up, especially in the advent of electrocardiogram. What else did you figure out by using halothane? People woke up quicker. Was it more or less soluble? Yes. Katie? It was less. It was less soluble. Now that's the point you have to realize. If something is not soluble, it's not very potent. And since it's not very potent, right, it gets out of the body quick. But then you're going to say, sir, then how does it put people to sleep quickly and they wake up quickly? Because if something is not potent, what do you do? You give a lot of it. You increase the concentration. But right, think about the <coughs> other drugs you get. <clears throat> Who here has used the local anesthetic? Okay, you use varying concentrations, right? So who, you, have you used bupivacaine and lidocaine? So you notice that the concentration of lidocaine typically is four to eight times that in the vial of bupivacaine. Which one is more potent? Bupivacaine is more potent. Which one takes longer to set up? Bupivacaine. The one that sets up quickly is lidocaine. Why? Because you give a high concentration of it. But it doesn't last as long. Bupivacaine is very potent. So think about that idea as you um, look at these uh, gases that we're going over. So now, we're talking about ether, or halothane. And it was a great drug. Still is a great drug. But there's better drugs. One of them being sevoflurane, and then finally desflurane. Problem is, when you make a new drug, what happens to the cost of it? It goes up. So your most expensive volatile anesthetic right now is desflurane. OK. <clears throat> now who got this question right? Excellent. Good for you. So an ideal anesthetic agent. I want to breathe it in, and I want to control this patient. By controlling this patient, I want them to go to sleep quickly, but smoothly. I don't want to have them coughing or spewing or their blood pressure going up or anything like that. I want to be able to give a lot of it. Right, my therapeutic index, anybody not sure what that is? That is the, race, the, the distance between your LD50 and your ED50. Your effective dose for 50% of the population and your lethal dose for 50% of the population. So you want that to be huge. Right? And then you want minimal side effects. And then finally, you want them to recover smoothly, but rapidly. Why? Because you want an OR turnover. You don't want them sitting in your OR. You don't want them sitting in the pack you. You want this drug out of their body. <coughs> so this comes out of um, Barish, this table. The sixth edition, uh, seventh edition has the same table. And it goes over the qualities of an ideal anesthetic. And this is for the inhaled agents. Now it's very similar to the ideal qualities of intravenous agents, but there are some slight differences. And you will, you will be expected to understand what those differences are. 
Any questions? <clears throat> if I don't keep moving, I'm probably going to pass out. So keep going. So how do anesthetics work? If something has several hypotheses, major Weber, what does that usually mean? That's a lot of major work. No, a lot of logic. We all want to help you out, though. That's, that's, I congratulate your colleagues on that. Well, what do you think? They don't know. No one actually knows exactly how this works. There's this unitary hypothesis, and you will be required to know these hypotheses. Only in the um, the breath that I present them. Okay. So the unitary hypothesis means that they all work under one mechanism. That's it. Some mechanism exists for these anesthetics, and they all work the same way. That's the unitary hypothesis. <clears throat> the meyer overton hypothesis has to do with the oil-water partition coefficient. And it is directly related to your potency. So if more, if something is, if this substance is very potent, then it's very lipid-soluble according to this hypothesis. <clears throat> One thing I want to mention is, with the hypotheses, how do you know that they're not true? For example, the first one, how do you know that there's not a common mechanism? It's very simple. The literature shows that there's not a common mechanism. Right? The literature also shows that potency for the most part, does relate to lipid solubility, but not always. Okay, Just because something is lipid soluble doesn't mean it's a potent anesthetic agent. Now, the membrane lipid theory. This is kind of a cool one. This says that these molecules get inside of that amphipathic lipid bilayer that you learned about from Dr. Christie and disrupts the shape of it. And if you disrupt the shape of a lipid bilayer, what is in what is integral in those lipid bilayers? It's receptors and channels. And what do you do to the channel diameter when you distort the membrane? It changes shape and it doesn't work like it's supposed to. So that's a theory. The five angstrom theory, this one's kind of cool. It says that these inhalational agents all work on receptors that have pores that are five angstroms in distance. And it just happens that the GABA receptor has a pore site, a pore diameter, that is five angstroms. And then the simple receptor binding theory, or the protein theory, says that these Agents will bind to proteins. That's basically what it's saying. And those proteins are in your central nervous system. Now, the one that is the most recent is the oxygen pathway perturbation hypothesis. This one is near and dear to my heart because it is thought, or it has, it has been shown, that these molecules will activate the mitochondrial potassium ATP channel. And the potassium ATP channel is what I spent four years of my life learning about. This channel on the mitochondria, when activated, actually shuts down the mitochondria, quiesces it. It puts the cell into a hibernation state. Right? Think about that. You quiet the cell down, processes aren't there to conduct nerve transmission. And so if you quiesce nerve transmission, do you become sedated? Yes, you do. Now, and the last one is a general neurotransmitter hypothesis that says that these anesthetics will alter the release of neurotransmitters. But you can see how several of these tie in with each other. 
If you do one, then yes, the others are going to happen. I just want you to have this, this broad idea of what these hypotheses are. But in the end, we do not know how these work, right? Do they work as part of the membrane theory, as part of the receptor binding theory, so on and so forth? But we do know what these drugs look like. So let's go through our history again. And we can see the very first ones that were uh, out there especially were the chloroform, the cyclopropane, and the ether. Now, halothane, is halothane an ether? It is not. It's a halogenated alkane. But your modern anesthetics, your modern volatile anesthetics, because Major Fraley is nitrous oxide a volatile anesthetic? It is not. It is not considered a volatile anesthetic, even though it is a gas. All right? <clears throat> so your volatile anesthetics that you use today are desfluorane, sevofluorane, and isofluorane. You, you will be required to know those chemical structures. Why? Because those chemical structures make all the difference in the world. So we had this alkane we halogenated when we were talking about halothane, and it took away the flammability. It also decreased its solubility. So look at these bonds and the things that go around these bonds and relate them to your box on the left here. Okay, that box on the left. So we see our ether bond in our desfluorane and our sevofluorane and in our isofluorane. And now we can see the radical groups that are attached to this. Now if you look at that box on the left, and you looked at what's attached to that ether bond, you can make sense of why these drugs act the way they do. Isofluorine, it is your most soluble and most potent modern anesthetic. Sevofluorine has a moderate solubility, but you're looking at that and you'll say, sir, there's some, there's some problems with that I have, and we'll go over that. And desfluorane, based on its chemical structure, <laughs> is the least soluble and the least potent. Now think about what happened between isofluorane and desfluorane, right? Some super chemist guy put isofluorane in the lab, and he said, I'm going to remove that chloride and put a hydrogen on there. They're both pretty reactive with that radical group. And when he did that, whoever it was, I gotta go back and look in the history, he discovered that that change alone, that change alone greatly increased solubility and greatly decreased flammability. Isofluorine, you breathe it for a while, how long is it going to last? It's going to last, in some instances, up to depending on how long you run it, 12, 13 hours. Desfluorine, you're talking less than an hour if you run it for hours and hours and hours. <clears throat> okay, any questions on this right now? No, sir, I have no idea what you're talking about. Okay. Just going back to the where nitrous oxide falls into that. Okay. Is it less soluble? No, soluble? no, nitrous oxide is your most soluble agent. Think about its vapor pressure. Its vapor pressure is 39,000. 39,000. Think about the vapor pressure of desfluorine. Desfluorine is 669. Now, sir, I read one book where it says 666. I read another book where it says 670. You know, I, I read a book that said it was 669. So that's the number we're going to pick. And then you have isofluorine. And its vapor pressure is what? 
243. So you can see how the vapor pressures are correlated to liposolubility and hence potency. If something has a vapor pressure that is high, does it want to stay in a solution? No. It is trying everything. Think about that closed system that this gas is in. You put it in with a fat interface or a liquid interface, its vapor pressure is the stuff that gets out and puts pressure on the surroundings, right? So the higher the vapor pressure means more of that drug is trying to get out of that solution. It's trying to get out of that solution. And so in order to keep it in solution, what do you have to do to it? You have to concentrate it. You have to overpressurize it. Those concepts are fundamental. Not, they do not change with these gas anesthetics. Okay? Sorry, question. Yeah. Um, is nitrous oxide size also part of it? Size is also part of it. It's diffusibility is a big issue with it. We'll get into that. But nitrous oxide is not considered a volatile anesthetic. Right. Why? What do, you, what do you notice about nitrous oxide? What does it not have? It doesn't have organic compounds, right? It doesn't have it's carbon. It's not considered an organic substance. Your volatile agents are your organic anesthetics. All right? It has your CH bonds, your methyl groups. So this is just a slide that is starred for some ungodly reason that correlates with the previous slide. Now, who here thinks that they can tell me what I mean by my last bullet? Thinking about the structures we just looked at around that carbon or around that ether bond. <clears throat> if I put a hydrogen or a bromide in place of a chlorine, and only that change itself, not looking at the other things around it, but just that change, if I have one carbon or one ether bond, just one, nothing around it, and I put a hydrogen or a bromide on it, that is very soluble. And since that is very potent and very soluble, do you think the concentration required to get your effect will be high or low? It will be low. Okay, but if you use a low concentration of something, do you get your effect fast or slow? Slow. slow. But will that effect linger on or go away quickly? Linger. It will linger on. Again, that's a fundamental concept that doesn't change with these gas anesthetics. Tracking? Okay. Then if I take that bromide or that hydrogen off and replace it with a chlorine, it's not as soluble. Okay, it's not as soluble. And then if I put a fluorine on it, it is much less soluble. Much less soluble. So let's go back up here and look. Especially at the isofluorine, desfluorine structures. Okay, isofluorine, desfluorine structures. So, <coughs> let's look at the iso. We've got one, two, three, four four fluoride bonds, right, a hydrogen bond, or I'm sorry, five fluoride bonds, a hydrogen bond, and a chloride bond. That's fluorine. Okay, I probably should have circled another different one, but we replaced the chloride with a hydrogen, and what else did we do? We replaced a hydrogen with a fluoride. Yeah, I think I circled the wrong one. So, uh, you should have broken the real last thing. Sorry, your slide's wrong. Okay, excellent. Well, here's the thing you need to remember, as Mr. Smithers just said. So, in the end, you exchanged a chloride for a chloride. So, take off this green here and put it over here somewhere. Just remember to yourselves that you've exchanged a fluoride for a chloride. And now look at that huge change in property you get. Okay, what is the vapor pressure of isofluorine? 243. 
What is the vapor pressure of desflurane? 669. That is almost three times the vapor pressure, just with that little change. Just with that little change. Think about what's happening to its solubility, right? Excellent point, Mr. Smithers. Thank you. I should call him Captain Smithers, but just I got Mr. Smithers in my head. I hope you're okay with that. If not, just let me know. All right. Let's talk about these values here. What do they mean? Well, the blood gas partition coefficient. That is the most important property for you right now when it comes to solubility. That's the one you're going to have to learn first. What do those numbers mean? Anyone here want to give it a shot? What do you think, Freddie? What is a blood gas coefficient? You don't even have to look at the number. Just tell me what a blood gas coefficient is. Yep. It's a ratio to the amount of, that's in the blood at equilibrium to the amount that's in a gaseous state at equilibrium between a blood and air interface. What is your blood and air interface in this example? Your alveoli and your pulmonary vasculature. Tracking? Okay. So, if I look at isofluorine, Isofluorine, if I have 246 molecules of isofluorine at equilibrium between a blood and an air interface, how many molecules will be in the blood? I have 246 molecules total. 146. Right? Because what is a ratio? It is something over 1, correct? So it's 1.46 over 1. 1 1.46 parts will be in the blood state. One part will be in this air interface state. So again, if I had 246 molecules of isofluorine in this laboratory prepared gas blood interface, and I introduce 246 molecules into that interface, I'm using 246 because it makes for easy numbers, if you're all wondering where I get those 246 from. I'll have 146 molecules that will go into the blood interface, or blood state, and 100 molecules that will stay in the gaseous state. What is 146 divided by 100? 1.46. Which um, max level are you basing that on? That, that is a... That's irrelevant. This is related, but irrelevant. What? Your solubility coefficient. Again, it's related to your concentration required, but you cannot make a generalized correlation like that. Okay? Because if you're just using the blood gas, some of this won't make sense, especially if, when we get to talking about the muscle blood the brain blood, those coefficients are a little bit different. But when talking about the blood gas partition coefficient, this is the fundamental way that you're going to get gas into the blood. And if you can't get <coughs> gas into the blood, where can it not be delivered to? The brain, right? <clears throat> yeah? Just to, just to clarify, so it's... Uh... In your 246 example, 146 in the blood, and then Check. 100 is still in the gas state. That's right. Okay. So imagine, now you get 246 molecules in the lung for isofluorine. In the, imagine just one alveolar unit that is interfaced with a capillary. So you introduce 246 molecules. I'm using 246 because it's an easy number. And you see in your mind that 146 of them went into the blood, and 100 stayed in the gas at equilibrium. Do you understand why I'm saying that equilibrium? That's only if you just introduce that amount at that time. But what are you doing constantly? You're, keeping, you're pushing more and more and more and more and more and more in because you've got your vaporizer set at a concentration 
and your circuit is blowing all of this gas into the lungs. But at equilibrium, just with that amount, that's what you would see. So, so there's no net, like net movement back and forth instead of constant. That's when it's at equilibrium. Absolutely. So this is just when it is at equilibrium. Fit, you know, not 50-50 because it's 1.46. But if you have, yeah, I'm using these numbers. I, I would use 246 for ISO. I would use 165 for SIBO. I would use 142 for desflurane. And I would use 146 for nitrous if I were to give you examples of an equilibrium state and where those molecules would be at, at equilibrium. Okay. So if I'm using desflurane with 142 molecules, how many would be in this fictional lung unit and the fictional pulmonary vasculature? 42 over 100, right? So what was the, what was the vapor pressure of SIBO again? You said vapor pressure of SIBO was, um, oh crap, six. I didn't say SIBO, I said ISO. So ISO and Des said. Uh, I want to say it's 170. But see, that's where a vapor pressure doesn't necessarily correlate with Yeah, so sevofluorine is a little different. Sometimes it acts like iso, and sometimes its properties act like desfluorine. In the blood gas coefficient, it acts more like desfluorine. But we will find out that its fat blood coefficient is very similar to isofluorine. And as you'll learn, the longer you run a drug like this, it's going to get stored in the fat. And that co coefficient will tell you the quantity in relation to what's being stored in the fat. Right? Yeah. When you talk about if you were to magically be able to deliver just the right amount of agent to reach the equilibrium. That's what I'm talking about. This is an imaginary situation presented to illustrate a purpose. Right? But what you're doing, you're either turning on the gas or you're turning it off. You're never going to have this equilibrium. Ever. Ever, ever. Because you're always giving more to the system than what's being returned. Until you turn off your gas, right? So if you were to magically have <laughs> this lung unit by itself, and you are able to deliver that quantity of drug, 146 molecules, or, or 246 molecules, or 246 parts, however you want to look at it, that's what you would see in that interface. So you're never going to actually have that example that you're looking for. What would be your delivery? You're never going to have it. <clears throat> Take a break. <clears throat> See you back in five minutes. <clears throat> See how confusing these can be? Kind of. So, do you say that that's an
slide with the ether bonds, just take that green H that is on desflurane and throw it over onto a uh, fluorine. That's all. Okay, so this chart is a money chart. Why is it a money chart? Because this odor right here is the perennial Board question. Based on what you read there, what would be two? So if we were to look at isofluorine, desfluorine, and sevofluorine, which one of those would you think, based on what it says there about odor, is probably not very fun to breathe in? That's boring. That is your perennial board question. Desfloraine is not very nice for inhalational inductions. The sweetest one out of the modern agents. Well, that's not a, that's not a volatile anesthetic. Sevo. fluorine is your sweetest when you're looking at the modern agents. <laughs> 
I don't think halothane is still on your boards, but if it were, that would be your choice for induction if given halothane and SIBO, because halothane is sweeter than SIBO fluorine. Everybody got what I just said? Most pungent, that's fluorine, not easy to breathe. If you're talking about modern anesthetics, SIBO fluorine is easier to breathe than ISO and DES. If you're talking about the historical halothane, that's the sweetest of all. Nitrous is sweet, but it is not a volatile anesthetic. Now we're going to learn about pharmacokinetics of these agents. And this is, yeah. I was just going to ask, um, for desfluorine, so it's uh -huh. not nice for inhalation induction, but once the patient's induced. Once the patient's induced. You can crank it. Yep. And, and guess what you're using to induce? Propofol. Propofol. Right? And you're like, why are we learning all this about the gases? Well, you understand how it works going in. You're going to understand how it works coming out. Right? So now let's talk about the movement of these gases. It is necessary to understand how they move. Oh, I wanted to tell you one more thing, too. You're going to hear a joke on the SIBO fluorine induction for kids, right? And the joke is, why does the why is the SIBO fluorine vaporizer at 8%? And the joke is, you know, we get it because we're weird, because it doesn't go to 9. The point there is you're trying to give as much as you can for the kids for their inhalational induction. But the reason it doesn't go to 9 is because in that concentration it becomes flammable. Okay, and the reason that your desflurane vaporizer only goes up to 18% is because at over 3 mac, it becomes flammable. So over 4 mac for SIBO, you start to get the flammability, and over 3 mac for DES. And we'll get those mac values in a second. So let's talk about the movement of the gas. One thing that uh, Christopher brought up is an excellent point. Sir, you're never going to get to that equilibrium, are you? You're right, that blood gas equilibrium, you're never going to get there. Why? Because as soon as you deliver, we'll say the isofluorine example, as soon as you deliver 146 parts of gas to the blood, does it stay there? It's being delivered to fat, to muscle, to kidneys, to brain, and they all have their own partition coefficients. Right? Think of it like a bus stop. You get on the bus at the lungs, you get off the bus at the liver, at the kidneys, at the fat, at the muscle. So you have all those bus stops that you make. Okay? Now where do you measure this gas concentration? It's at the Y piece on your circuit. The Y piece is that little connection that on your circle system, and there's going to be a little doohickey that a sampling line that brings out the gas at 200 mL per minute, and that goes into the analyzer, and it's going to give you a concentration. <clears throat> but is that a true indicator of what's going on? It's an estimate. It's the best we have. It's the best we have. So this diagram I created to try to help you understand the flow of this anesthetic. You are assuming that what is in the alveolus is in the brain. But is that true? This is just a very rough assumption because as soon as you start the gas, do you think what you're delivering is in the brain? No. And how about when you turn off the gas? Right? What is being returned to the alveolus isn't necessarily what's still in the body. It is just an estimation. Think about all these compartments now that you have to fill up. You have to deliver it from the circuit to the alveolus, and then from the alveolus into the arterial system. And then from the arterial system, you have to go to the body, right? The fat group, the muscle group, and the vessel-rich group. And what do you think falls inside of the vessel-rich group? The brain. 
as well as the lungs, the heart, the kidneys. So that gas molecule has to go through all of those compartments. Now, a, one gas molecule doesn't have to go, will not go to each compartment. But if you give 146 molecules into the blood that move away from the lungs in the isochlorine example, you're going to have a large proportion of them, right? Just for example purposes, this is not true, but we'll imagine 80 of them go to the fat group. And then we can imagine that 40 of them go to the muscle group. That's about right. So what does that leave for the vessel rich group? The brain, the lungs. Not very much. So what do you got to keep doing? You got to keep delivering it through the circuit. That's why your concentration is on your vaporizer. Everybody seeing this in your mind? That's my goal. So that you can actually see this molecule go through the circuit. Here's a picture out of Morgan and McHale. It kind of gives you a visual of the machine, your circle system, your Y piece, right? Because your Y piece is where you are measuring your concentration of agent. And what is the unit that you use to measure that concentration? MAC. MAC is that unit. I will say this probably 10 million times. MAC is a calculation in your mind but it is concentration that is on the dial. MAC is a calculation of concentration in your mind, but concentration is actually what is on the dial. If you're saying one MAC in your head, and you're looking at desflurane, what is that concentration on the dial? 6%. If you're saying one MAC of sevoflurane in your mind, that concentration of sevoflurane on the dial is 2.1%. I'm using 2.1, that's a generic one that they use, almost like 2. If I am thinking 1 mac of isofluorine in my mind, I have 1.15% on the dial. Everybody see that? Okay. Now, what do we have to do with gas? We have to fill up these compartments. And what is the principle that governs how quickly you fill up something. The three-letter word, tau. Time constants, right? Time constants. All right, here we go with the really, the first really abstract concept, in my opinion, is this tau. I have all of these compartments that I want to fill up with the gas. But what's the first one you want to fill up? The alveolus and the blood, right? That's that first little area you want to fill up. So, the time it takes to fill up 63% of that alveolus is one tau. You're not filling up the alveolus. You're only changing the concentration of whatever you're delivering, whether it be 1% SIBO, 2% SIBO, 1% desflurane, 6% desflurane, 0.5% isofluorine or 1.15% isofluorine, the amount you're delivering, as long as it's constant, it will take however long one tau to fill up 63% of that alveolus. Now that tau is going to be related only to the volume of the <coughs> container and the flow into it. What's the container you're trying to fill up? The lungs. What's your flow into it? Where do you set that at? On the Thorpe tube, on the machine. Okay? So, whatever concentration of agent we have, as long as we keep it constant, as long as we keep it constant, we've got a couple containers that we want to fill up. Because you've got to remember that that circuit itself is empty. So we have to get that circuit filled first. It has its own tau. <clears throat> circuit has its own volume. <coughs> I am so sorry about this. So a circuit volume, some circuits will be two liters, some will be less, some will be more. 
But you can think about that circuit volume being two liters. And let's say you're delivering 80% of the gas that you kept constant on the vaporizer. Now, the ability to fill up that circuit is going to be inversely proportional to what? The flow that you dial in. Inversely proportional. What do you mean, sir? Well, the circuit volume is constant, right? Two liters, we'll say, in this example. So I have to, if I, if I, for example, just dial in one liter per minute, how long is it going to take for my circuit to reach one tau? Not 63 minutes. So two over one is what? Two minutes, right? So now, that's just one tau. That's just one tau. How many tau does it take to fill up a container? Five. So if it takes two minutes to reach 63% filling, how long until that circuit is full of gas? Or whatever concentration? Ten minutes, that's right. right. So imagine yourself this pediatric induction. I keep bringing this up because this is really the only time that you use this to your advantage. You include the Y piece. You turn up your SIBO fluorine for whatever concentration you're going to turn it up to, but you turn it up five or so. And you turn on your flows to 10 liters or 8 liters. And by doing that, right, if this circuit volume is 2 liters and you've got your flow into it at 8 liters, how many minutes will it take for that circuit to be filled with whatever concentration of agent you're delivering? 2 divided by 8 is? So, quarter of a minute which is 15 seconds, right? 2 divided by 4 is 0.25, right? Okay, so 15 seconds. 15 divided, or 15 times 5 is what? 75 seconds. So you're going to hold that white piece for 75 seconds at 8 liters per minute, just in this example, to get that concentration of what you want. And usually, for the pediatric example, what are you doing? You're turning it up to 8 because it doesn't go to 9, right? So you turn it up to 8%, so in 75 seconds, in this example that we're giving with a 2-liter circuit, you're able to fill up that circuit with 8% sevofluorine, or change the concentration of the air in that circuit to 8% sevofluorine in 75 seconds. Everybody tracking there? Any questions on that? So think about that. If you are delivering agent in the case, and you want to change the concentration of agent in the body, say you want to lighten up the patient or you want to get them deeper, just because you change the concentration on the vaporizer doesn't mean you're immediately changing the concentration in the body. Tracking? You're going to have to have five time constants of uh, whatever the tau is, so however many minutes it is, to change those concentrations. And do you, do, you, do you think, I get excited when I talk about this, do you think that you just have simple compartments, one or two compartments? No. Fat, muscle, liver, <coughs> blood, kidneys, heart, lungs. Each one of those is a compartment. So let's take a prototypical example here that you might see on a test. This is for tau to reinforce the concept. I give you this mythical volume, this mythical box, and it has air inside of it. Okay? And it has 100 liters in it. And I also give you a gas at whatever the concentration is. It doesn't matter. But I deliver that gas into this box at 10 liters per minute. Doing the math, I know that it is going to take 10 minutes to change the air inside of that box to 63% of the concentration that you are delivering through the circuit. Okay? Because now this, we're assuming that the circuit is already full. Okay? So once your circuit is full, now you're delivering it to a mythical volume here. 
It takes 10 minutes to change the concentration in that box with whatever's in your circuit. So how long is it going to take to change the concentration to be equal to that what's in the circuit? 50 minutes. When you, when you study this concept, you have to think about it like that. You're not, I say filling, but in my mind, I know that I'm talking about changing concentration of an air-to-air -air interface in this example. In this example. That's another whole variable that we are not going to get into. Yes, sir? Is tau a concept to T1 Nah, you're talking decay curves, but yes, similar in the fact that a decay curve, one tau for decay curve is 63% is removed. So yes, in that, if you have something that you're starting off with a steady state, and you turn it off. In one tau, 63% of that will be removed from the body. So now we're talking about delivering some, hopefully to get to a steady state. And so now that's the opposite. To fill that container, to fill that container, change the concentration, it takes that one tau to change it by 63%. You see how those can take five tau to a steady state. Exactly, and it takes five tau to get the drug out of your body. Yeah. It's taking 50 minutes to saturate the alveoli, as we were talking about in this example. In this example, it's taking 50 minutes to change this 100 liter box. Oh, okay. This is a bo mythical box. All right, here's a visual to try to help you understand this concept. If you look at the box on the right, okay, so one tau, right, I've got this mythical 100 liter box. So the previous example is now a visual here. That first box is 100 liters, 100 liters in this box. And now at one tau, I'm able to change 63% of that box to the concentration I'm delivering. But that leaves 37% empty. So guess what? That becomes a new box. What? Yeah, it becomes a new box. And now you need to fill that box. But it's going to take one tau to fill that 37 liters to 63% of what you're delivering. So that means you've got 37% of that 37 liters that is not filled. So it's going to take another one tau to fill up that box and so on and so forth, right? So you see, you change the first box. Now you've got a space, if you will, that is empty. You fill the second one, right? Now you've got the space that is empty. Now you have to fill that one, and so on and so forth. What's that? It's going to ask, what's the 37? Because this is kind of the same concept as... Uh... 37 is... So think about this. If I take 63%, Okay, now take, let's imagine that we're talking 100 liters here. So I have 63 liters in that box, in that first towel, right? Okay, so now I've got 37 liters that I have to fill up. What is 0 0.63 times 37? Add that to the 63, and what does that leave you with? You, now you filled up 86 liters, and so on and so forth. Correct? Yes, I do. I was, the, the comment I was making was that the natural potential, it's the same thing. But that's a decay curve. Right, but it's still 37. That's right. So, so again, decay curve is very similar to steady state curves, or the ability to achieve steady state. All right, so now we've hit that. Yep, yep, yep. yep. So let's do a, an example you might see on the test. I've got this circuit that's 8 liters in this particular example. And I have a fresh gas flow of X percent concentration of agent. It doesn't matter what it is, as long as it stays steady, as long as you keep the vaporizer or whatever you want. And I want to change the concentration of that circuit to be the same as I'm delivering from the vaporizer. 
that I'm delivering at four liters per minute. So I have my volume of eight, and I have my fresh gas flow at four liters per minute. What is my tau in this example? Two minutes. How long until the circuit changes concentration? Ten minutes. Five tau. Good. For those of you that are mathematically inclined, we will not be tested on this example, but it is where this concept comes from. It's the exponential formulation, if you ever wanted to use this. I'm not going to go over it because we're not going to be tested on it. I want you to stick to the, the volume <coughs> over the flow. Okay? Now, for those of you that want to talk about this, I won't discuss it with you that officially. But if you want to talk about this for your own edification, come see me. All right. Now, let's talk about we filled up the circuit. Now we need to include the law. What is that going to do to my ability to change concentrations in the circuit when I add the lung to it? All right. We're going to talk about that. Also notice on this graph, and I, I haven't told you this, but this graph on your y-axis is talking about the alveolar concentration over the inspired concentration on the y-axis. And then time is your x-axis. So think about that. Where are you measuring the alveolar concentration? At the y piece. And then you're delivering a flow, right? So where do you measure that? Where does it show up? Where do you see that alveolar concentration at? On the monitor. What particular variable on the monitor? Your end tidal agent. Everybody remember? You've seen these monitors. They have end tidal oxygen. They have end tidal nitrogen. They also have end tidal anesthetic agent. <clears throat> so that number you see is a reflection of this curve. Okay, with that said, now how does the lung affect the ability to fill up the circuit? So now let's imagine we're starting from scratch. We've got an empty circuit and empty lungs. We turn on a flow. In this case, it's four liters per minute. And we crack our vaporizer to whatever percent we're going to put it on. And we keep it there. Now, it's not the same model as we had previously because we've added the lung to it. Previously, we said that it would take two minutes to achieve one tau in this circuit. We did that calculation. But now, look at this. We have an additional uh, leech, if you will. <coughs> this leech is the lung. And the lung has its own flow. <coughs> Now, if this patient spontaneously ventilating, that flow will be the patient's minute ventilation. And minute ventilation is what? Rate times volume. And you may be controlling it if it's mechanically ventilating with rate times volume. Yes, sir. So are we getting this at 40 per minute or 5 liters per minute? Those are separate. Okay. okay. Yeah. So the 4 liters per minute is what you dial in. And that's on the Thor's tube. But where is that 5 liters per minute coming from? The patient. The patient. That 5 liters per minute is coming from the patient. Whether or not they're spontaneously ventilating with a minute ventilation of 5 liters per minute, or whether you have dialed in 5 liters per minute mechanically as your minute ventilation. You can, you can change that to whatever you dialed in. But in this example, this is how it works out. So now I have 5 liters per minute, and I have a volume in the lungs of two and a half liters that I'm trying to change over. So just by that itself, when you're looking at the flow from the circuit into the lung, what's your tau? Five or 0.5. So it's going to take 30 seconds, roughly. 30 seconds to fill up or change the concentration of that lung to be 63% of what is in your circuit. Okay. 
Now that is a convoluted calculation if you want to get exact about it based upon that exponential that I've already done for you and that's where the 2.6 comes from. But if you want to keep it simple, which I want you to do for your testing purposes, by roughly how much does it change the ability of the initial volume to reach tau, to reach 63%. Huh? Increases, increases the amount of time it takes. It does, by, by roughly how much? By roughly the tau of the second container. Right? That is how I want you to look at it. The second container, the flow and the volume of the second container will roughly affect the ability of the first container to change its concentration. That is what this example was trying to show you. Okay? Questions? Yeah. This is one tau. This is this is separate. Okay. Okay. You calculate as one. That's one compartment now. Yeah, no, that, that's one compartment right there. But this compartment is affected by this. And this compartment is affected by the flow from this. But this flow is related to the patient and not the machine. Tracking? So you basically would say that you just have to add for every vol every container you add on to you're adding that's the containers individual to have. To have a rough estimate, that's correct. It won't be exact, but it'll be a rough estimate. Did you hear what he said? Basically, each container's tau and the flow coming from the... So that first container has a flow going into the second container. You have to know what that is. right? What will be the flow going into the muscle group or the fat group? Your cardiac output. Absolutely. So that flow, now say it's 5 liters per minute. Now you need to know how much fat the person has to figure out what, you know, what's happening. And in that case, what is going to be the flow into the container? Again, it's the cardiac output. And what will be the volume of the container? If it's the cardiac output, what's the volume of the five liters? Yeah. Way too complicated. Don't even go there yet. Wait till you master this until you get to that point. But I hear what you're saying. Just roughly, though, go with just the cardiac output to get a rough estimate of what's happening in those other containers if you want to add on another compartment. Only compartment I'm going to add on for you guys is from the circuit to the lungs. Yes? That's right. Yes? The gas is flowing into the circuit. The, 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 the liters per minute off the machine is not flowing directly into the lungs. It's only flowing into the circuit. In order to get flow to the lungs, that's minute ventilation. Right? And then you can't use minute ventilation when you're talking about a third compartment, if you would. But now we're talking about the alveolus to the blood. Now that's a different flow. Yeah? So, from a practical Yes. Every time you're getting ready for pediatric consumption, right? Because are we using these gases to induce patients? No. Only if we're not having any propofol around or any accommodator. If our induction agents aren't available, then yes, you are priming your circuit to get that circuit filled. And then in that case, let's say that this circuit is already filled. And we've got a, we changed the circuit 100% of what we're delivering. And in this case, we would say 2% uh, sevoflurane. So we have one MAC, right? We have a, an amount in the circuit that is going to put 50% of the people to sleep or keep them from moving. How long in this example until that patient reaches a concentration in the lungs that is 
two percent because the circuit's already filled. So thirty seconds times five is two and a half minutes for that patient to quote unquote fill their lungs up. But it's not that simple. Why? Because the lungs are attached to what? The blood and the other compartments. So the what? 3.2 is one tile of the lung? This is if you're doing, this is if I want to fill up the lungs and the circuit. That's the three minutes to add on to fill up the, the lungs and the circuit. So your circuit's already going to be, uh, I'm sorry, your circuit and your lungs to reach one tile at the same time will be 3.2 minutes of this example. So how did I get that? That's this calculation, adding another compartment to it. It's mathematics that I'm trying to have you just do a rough estimate. So where did you get two and a half? What is two plus 0.5? Two and a half. And that's going to be the circuit. And then I add another 0.5. That will be the lungs and the circuit. You see that? Why are we First one is going to affect this. And then now, now this is affected. But just because this is 63%, doesn't mean that this is 63%. In order for this to be 63%, this has to be totally changed in concentration. So that when it, this is siphoning from here. And because it's siphoning, it is removing some of this 63%. Now, once this gets to 63% change, one power, because of the siphoning, this isn't even close to being 63% changed yet. So that's going to take an additional half a minute. Yes? So it would be fair to say once you look at the lungs, we reach one towel, and the circuit will be greater than one towel, and possibly in order for the lungs to reach one towel. Yeah, you could say that. Yes. I know what you're saying. This, this, uh, I think the, the configuration of that curve is what's throwing you off. What you said is absolutely correct. So after you've reached 63% change in the circuit, after it's been affected by the lungs, that's what the dotted line is. That, that's that change in the time it's going to take because of the lung, which is adding the tau of the circuit with the tau of the lungs. That's two and a half now, roughly, right? You see that 2.6 at the bottom? If you do the actual calculation, it's 2.6 minutes instead of two minutes. But if you just guess, a rough guesstimate, not a guess, but a rough estimate, you can say 2.5 there. Now, that siphoning has affected the original volume by the tau of the second, the second container. Now, but that's, that's not the end of it. The second container still has to reach at 63%. And so in this example, because the circuit has to fill before the lungs can fill, you've added the tau to the original volume. Now you have to do the um, tau for the volume itself. Is that helping? Yeah. So you're adding. <laughs> Okay, enough on that. So we'll come see me later. But as Patrick said, the point that additional compartments will affect the ability to reach a concentration in the previous compartments. Every time you add a new compartment, it is going to affect the ability to achieve a concentration in the previous compartment. If they're connected by varying flows. That's it. But it doesn't work like one gets filled and the other. They're all kind of filling They're all filling simultaneously. Huh? Yeah. It's they're leaking, isn't it? Exactly. It's yeah. leaking. Yes, sir. Well, you're going to see pharmacolo pharmacolo pharmacologic calculations for kinetics that are calculated on one compartment, two compartment, three compartment models. And they get more complex as you go. 
Okay. So it's all well and good, right? But what is this FAFI crap? Yeah. <laughs> all right. So what is this? Well, in order to understand that, we're going to we're going to we're going to leave that concept of tau behind now for a second. I want you to follow me now into understanding what the y-axis on that graph meant. And in order to understand what that y-axis on that graph meant, you have to understand what these terms mean. So let's go over these terms. You may hear FD. That is the concentration that's coming out of the machine. Okay? And that includes what's going into the circuit. But, although it's very close to and at times will mimic um, the Y piece, there are things that could affect the circuit that, not, that don't necessarily give you an equal concentration being delivered at the Y piece. With that being said, usually the FD is equal to the FI. The FI is the inspired concentration that you are measuring at the Y piece. The patient is breathing into the lungs. And then the FA is what is measured and what you're assuming is in the alveolus at the end of expiration. So when do you measure FA? At the end of expiration. On what apparatus? The Y piece, which shows up where? What part of the monitor specifically? The entitled concentrations. That's right. So here are the ratios you have to become familiar with. The FD to FI and the FA to FI. What would be some things that would change FD to FI? So I'm coming out of the machine going into the circuit. This rubber hose, it'll soak up some of the agent. So what you're delivering out of the machine and into the circuit isn't necessarily what's being delivered at the Y piece. Does that make sense? What if you have a leak? Okay. That's another example. All right, so FA. Your FA is going to change, right? And what is it going to be related to? What's being taken out and what's coming back in. So it's going to be emptied by the arterial blood. And until the body fills up with whatever you're delivering, you're not going to have anything delivered back by the venous system. But once your compartments begin to fill up, your venous system begins to rise, right? The venous system begins to rise. And when that venous system begins to rise, what happens to your FA? It starts to go up. Yes. Fresh gas flow. FGF is fresh gas flow. All right. Everybody tracking on what I just said there? Okay. All right, so we talked about what things can affect the FD to FI. I don't want you to worry about this uh, bottom question. I'm not going to ask you that on the test, but I may ask you what could change what's being delivered into the circuit by what is being delivered to the patient at the Y piece. And we just talked about it. It could be a leak. It could be soaking up into the rubber tubing, if it's a rubber tubing, that sort of thing. Okay, these curves, you see them in every book just about. Now you're starting to understand what they mean. So, let's imagine that you are delivering one MAC of each of these agents. Okay, we'll just use one. You could use whatever you wanted, but we're just going to say one MAC here. One MAC. So for halothane, that's 0.75%. For isofluorane, that's 1.15%. For sevoflurane, 2%, we'll say. Okay, it makes it easy for math. Desflurane, 6%. And what is the MAC for nitrous? 100%. Can you ever deliver that? 
you know, you'd, you'd kill a pig. But in this example, we'll say it's 100%. Um, I'm sorry, ISO 1.15. ISO 1.15. Then it's 6. Then it's 2. Two, we'll say 2%, huh? It's 0.75%. You may read 0.77, but 0.75 makes for easy math. Okay, so what is this saying here? If I want to induce somebody, and I leave it at one max, and I don't change the concentration, I don't overpressurize the circuit, I have a steady liters per minute of, we'll say, 8 in this example, because that will work out if you're doing certain circuits, but if I keep the flow constant and I'm delivering one MAC of agent, an asymptotic, uh, the ability to put someone to sleep is going to be directly related for these agents to reach what? One. A reflection of what you're delivering into the lungs Right? what's being breathed out at end expiration over what you're delivering. And so you want those to approach each other, right? If you're delivering 6% desflurane, you know that at 6% desflurane, that is what is going to get me to keep someone from moving, right? 50% of the people, 6%. Now, we are delivering one MAC of agent in this example. One MAC, 6%. Are we going to reach MAC in this example in the body? No, but you get close. What do you think when this gets to approaching its flattened part of the curve that's in the body right now? What percent? It's roughly 0.8 times 6%. You see that? Because 0.8 is the ratio that is in your alveolus at the end expiration. Right, so 4.8 over 6% is, or 4.2 over 6% is 0.8, right? Is that right? No, 4.8. 4.8 over 6%. So 4.8% is in the body now, because that curve has reached this asymptotic flattening. Okay, and so if you're using one MAC in this example, just this example, okay? In 30 minutes, in this example, you're going to have 4.8% concentration in the body in this example. And why are you saying that? Because at end expiration, you're delivering 4.8% back into the alveolus. Tracking? No, sir. Yeah, Come see where you're your what is this? Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm saying this is, maybe it's a little bit above point eight. What are you delivering, in, what are you, what is the patient inspiring? Six percent, that's what we've said. And so, this is saying what is being returned to the alveolus, right? Because that is what you measure at end expiration. Yeah because that's what you're delivering. It's 6% times that ratio, because you're delivering, so that 6% would be your FI. 6.0 is the denominator. And your 0.8, to get, so X over 6.0 is equal to 0.8. So X would equal 4.8. Let's do it with single point. Yes. But this, Woo! Well, that's not that, so. That's not mad. That's not mad. If you're never getting, so the point here is you're never going to get the patient to sleep. So what do you have to do? Increase. You have to increase your concentration. This is just showing you what's going to happen at a at a concentration. I'm using one map to highlight a point. Right? You're going to have to change. Are you ever going to get someone to sleep with just one map? You've got to overpressurize the system if you want them to breathe themselves down to sleep. And then once they breathe themselves down to sleep, what do you do? You lessen up the agent. That's all based on this concept. If I deliver two MAC of desflurane, okay, now let's do this math. Two MAC is what? 
and I have this person that can tolerate this pungent desflurane, right? And so we're going to crank it up to 2% on it. And in 30 minutes, I want you to estimate, because it's not going to be exact, I want you to estimate in 30 minutes what percent of gas he has in his compartments in the body. It's going to be, it's going to be x over 12% is equal to 0.8. Tracking? Yeah. What is it? I have 9.6%, but I don't know if that's close. Okay, that's close. That's, that's... 9.6, sir, that's what's in the body right now. That's what's being delivered back to the alveolus. Right, because what do you measure your gas? At end, end expiration, at the alveolus. Which, and the end expiration is going to be related to what? No, 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 end expiration is related to this. What is being delivered back to the alveolus from the venous system? And in order to get the concentration in the venous system to fill up, what do you have to do? Start to saturate now. Who said it earlier that, but sir, this is not happening one at a time? That was you, right? They're all filling up at the same time, but it's dumping off on certain areas, and then some of it is getting back to the venous system, which means that some of it gets back to the alveolus. Now look at this graph in that context. Wimmer's like, I have no freaking clue what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. Could you... If you were to leave it at, at six, with, with, with we're leaving it. We're, 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 it does some, you're just leaving this. We're, let's use the six percent again. You turn it on. You have a constant flow rate. All right. So after, if I wanted to say, how long does it take to reach a end tidal concentration in this example of point or of three point six? Using desflurane, how many minutes would you say roughly? One or two? Okay. Now let's use sevoflurane. Let's say I'm using four percent sevoflurane. Leaving it on there doesn't matter. I have a constant flow. Now I ask you, how long until I get 0.8 percent sevoflurane? I'm sorry, I said, I said 4%. Yeah. I get 1.6% sevoflurane on my end tidal concentration. It's going to be like a minute, 30 seconds maybe. You see where those are coming from. Mm -hmm. So if you were to leave it on at, at one mat. Uh, one uh, one hour, mat, for which one? Or whichever. Okay, one mat, got it, for an hour. Yeah, for does, an that hour. Patient go to, does that patient achieve mat? After an hour? No. So still no? Nope. Okay. You will never reach it. Why? Because that's an asymptote. It's never that's gotta get up to one. Okay. That's gotta so how do you manipulate this? Increase concentrations. Increase concentrations. And then you have to adjust flows to deliver it, right? Everybody starting to get it now? Cool? Yeah. All right. Still think FAI has to be more or, or you get nothing. Uh, so that number if you're delivering a clinically one mac or above. One mac or above. Now remember, one mac is only for fifty percent of the population. Right. So you said you wanted to switch one point two percent. Yeah. Yeah. One point six percent. So basically, you go on the left axis, the right axis, the point fours. Yeah. That's it. That's all I was doing with that, right? Because point four over one is equivalent to 1.4 over 4. And that's that sevoflurane example. And I'm capturing this lecture, so make sure you go back and listen to what I'm saying. I'm capturing this lecture. Okay. I, I think in clinical practice, just how many folks just tend to, instead of calculating all this out, just you get, wait I'll I'll be surprised if you have any freaking clue what I'm talking about five years from now. So in clinical practice, how many of y'all just wait for the FA and FI to be plus the one and say go? Oh. They don't even consider it in clinical practice. They just adjust their can. That's all they do. They, all they realize is that i got to spin the can, and it's going to take a little bit for this to change. Right? But, but, 
I don't even need to worry about that because what am I going to give if I need to get someone deep quickly? I'm going to give something IV. This is not the drug that you want to use to make quick changes. But you have to understand why it takes so long to make these changes on my exam. Well, all right. <laughs> Yes, sir. I, to, I feel like I, I'm beating a dead horse. But I'm, I'm telling you, to... this is the toughest block when it comes to farm. Go ahead. Why is, is it, again, that if you were to leave it on at one mat for like four hours, why wouldn't you achieve mat if everything's getting concentrated? It's called volume of distribution. How big is your volume of distribution for these drugs? Huge. Okay. Huge. So now that total liter capacity is huge. I mean, You've got a volume distribution of 100 in some departments, of 300 in other departments. So you're talking about massive leaders, right, that you have to saturate. You're never going to get there unless you run this drug for 24 or 36 hours, right? But if you want to get quicker to that concentration, you've got to overpressurize the system. Okay. I need you to understand that this Y piece is your bread and butter. That is where you measure the end concentration of these volatile anesthetics at end expiration. Because at end expiration, what is that a reflection of? What is being delivered to the alveolus by the venous system. Venous system. So how much of this is backed up? Okay. What's that? So come see or write me a question if you have it. Okay, so here is an example of where you would find the end tidal agents. Where, where is it at on here? Bottom right. Bottom right. Okay. Oops, let me go back. Now you're also going to use this, this parameter, the FAFI, when you pre-oxygenate. And this is an example that I'm going to give you on your test. If you have 100% oxygen that you're delivering at a certain flow rate per minute, how will you know that you are adequately pre-oxygenated? What would you like your FI, FAFI to start to approach? One, you're never going to get there, but at those concentrations and flows, you're probably going to get to 0.9 relatively quickly within five minutes as long as you turn up your flows to 10 liters per minute or, what, you know, as long as you understand that. But that's how you know you're pre-oxygenated, when your FA approaches what you're delivering. So if you are, if the patient's blowing out 90% oxygen and inspiring 10% or 100%, you know that you've got a good amount in the FRC. Tracking. So, again, we're going to utilize that concept when we pre-oxygenate these patients for five minutes. We turn on our flows to 8 to 10 liters per minute. What is their FA going to be initially? It's not 0.21. It's 0.16, roughly, because they're blowing out 16% oxygen. If you're ever doing CPR and you have to blow in on somebody's mask, you're delivering 16% oxygen. Okay, so that's where you're starting out at. And you want to see that increase to about 0.9 or 90% expiration. So I want you to keep those numbers in your head. On the more modern mo uh, monitors, you're going to see it down here. Now, based on Desplorane here, what is the assumption you're making about MAC for desplorane here. So you can actually calculate it. What is 5 divided by 6? Point 0.8 roughly almost. Okay, but what is your FA to FI for des here? 0.9 something. You see how they're not the same? Just because you have an FAFI that's higher to 1 doesn't mean you're anywhere close to MAC. It's just the saying that what you are delivering is starting to approach 
what you're expiring. You, you, you manipulate what you expire by turning up your flows and over-concentrating your agent. Tracking? I know I'm beating this up, but this is fundamental. Oh wow, I got ahead of myself. So, just because you have that FAFI that is approaching one, doesn't mean that you have induced a patient. It just means whatever you're delivering from the circuit is starting to equilibrate and be returned by the venous system to the alveolus and that exp and expiration, you're seeing on your monitor a percentage that is approaching what you are delivering. Oh my God, shut up. We're almost done here. Uh, we'll quit here. We'll, we'll see you next time. What slide am I on? Okay. All right, come see me if you have questions on the FAF. <laughs> We turn off the video. Yeah, no problem, sir. <laughs> I'm doing my best to explain it. It's tough. No, I, I feel like, I mean, even though I've had a lot of experience with the CRNAs I worked with in my FST, it's still difficult. To... <clears throat> no, it's tough. It's tough. There's no doubt. <laughs> God, I hope that that captured. Yes, I have no idea. For the. No, this should be. 